Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Jillian McAllister. Jillian is the New York Times bestselling author of recent book club pick, Wrong Place, Wrong Time, Everything But the Truth, the Choice, the Good Sister, the Evidence Against You, How to Disappear, and the Richard and Judy book club pick, That Night. She graduated with an English degree before working as a lawyer, and she lives in Birmingham, England, where she now writes full-time. She's also the creator and co-host of the popular Honest Authors podcast, and her latest book, which I just stayed up too late to finish, is called Just Another Missing Person. Welcome, Jillian. Hi. Thank you for having me back. Oh, so we were just talking uh, before we got on the air about the fact that it's been exactly a year since, and I think I learned about the Reese thing, like, five seconds after, you know, like a day or two after um, you and I talked. So that is so exciting. I know you had to keep that super, super secret and it had to have been hard. I so wanted to tell you, but yes, I was embargoed. I was embargoed. I, it was the hardest hey, secret of my life. <laughs> I'll bet it was, I bet it was, but I did know at that time that you were pregnant. You shared that with me um, after we got off the air. And I want to talk about just how much of your life has changed in this last year in such exciting ways. But first, before I get way, way ahead of myself, tell um, listeners about Just Another Missing Person. So Just Another Missing Person is another standalone thriller. It tells the story of Julia, who is a police officer, but she's also a mother. And she is assigned to a missing person investigation. And on the first day of it, she walks to her car, which is parked a little bit away from the police station. And there's a man in the back wearing a balaclava who tells her he knows her worst secret. And she has to do everything he tells him on this case. Otherwise, he's going to reveal it. Yes, yes. And and as a mother, You're of nodding. course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and as a mother, of course, this, you know, <laughs> this, this, this is about her daughter right I mean it's her daughter that's at risk here and that is of course why we all know every mother knows that we would do exactly what Julia did in an impossible situation yeah her daughter is liable for crime Julia used her police powers to cover it up and somebody now knows about that and so she is corruptible which was sort of what I wanted to write about like police corruption is a bit of a hot topic you know there's a show over here called Line of Duty that everybody's very into and I sort of thought it's very easy to write about you know police that want to make money on the side and will become corrupt but I was kind of thinking what if the corruption was actually understandable and relatable and that's kind of where it came from Yes, which it totally is. And then and then it is absolutely from there, completely Jillian McAllister, because there's a um, there's a middle of the book twist that turns the whole thing on its head. And then subsequent twists, where even from the in the last pages, as I was just saying, um, before we started recording, there are just those last twists that just leave you thinking, wow, masterfully done. And I know because I read I always read the acknowledgments. Um, you know, I love hearing what, who people think and that you basically, again, as we talked about last year, rewrote this book. This time, it sounds like even more times than normal. Yeah. So, so <laughs> we talked about so that you were going to stop doing that, I think, last time we talked. I know, <laughs> I've really not stopped. I'm, I'm doing it again right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I love that. So tell, so for those who missed the interview about Wrong Place, Wrong Time, which was, um, you know, such a fabulous book too. And my first, the first book of yours I'd ever read. And I, you know, when I read it, I thought, oh my God, I have to speak to her. So tell us about the process um, that you go through. It so sounds like with every book and maybe it's just going to be your way. Um, and, you know, what, you know, how does that work for you when you write the first draft and then you rewrite it? And it sounds like maybe even again this time. Yeah, usually, uh, for me, a first draft is a really dirty first draft, but actually, really, I, I do delete it, um, which really shocks everybody, usually, that I tell, but I start again from scratch, because something about writing the first draft that I, I can't get the information from doing a synopsis, something about it 
teaches me what the book is about. And then at some point during that first draft, usually towards the end, I learn what the book is about and I just select all and delete and start over. But yes, with just another missing person, I did that multiple times, actually, because the twist requires a big assumption by the reader and a lot of misdirection and I just couldn't get it to work <laughs> so I think I deleted it twice um so I'm I'm actually getting worse <laughs> <I'd say. laughs> um so when you say a first draft is dirty is it you know how long like how long is the first draft for you is it the full book or is it more like you know, is it, I'm trying to find ways in which to sort of salvage the fact that you write this book over and over by saying, is the first draft no, like 30,000 words? No, I wish it's like 90,000. Um, but I do it in like, well, nine weeks, really. Um, so there is time within my year to do this. And this is how I do it. Um, you know, yeah. very quick, multiple drafts is is my process. But yeah, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing this. <laughs> it's just what I do. <laughs> right. No, but it's not, so nine, so I don't know that we talked about the time of it last time. And that's really curious to me. So, because now you have a baby, congratulations. You have a little Thank boy you. who's got to be like, I do I'm going to get a boy. How old is he now? He's almost nine months. Which that is crazy. went by really fast for me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it did for me actually. Although I, I feel like he's been here forever as well. It's quite a weird yes. thing, isn't it? Yes. So tell us about how that has changed your. You know, I know when we talked before, you were, you know, your husband has is is sort of pri being the primary caregiver, or at least taking a lot of time off in order to help. Um, so that's helpful. But it is. But I know we also talked about the fact that as mom, it's really hard to sort of walk away and, and relegate that responsibility and also the time to somebody else. So how did that, how did that, did that go as you planned? It, it did and it didn't, I think. Um, so he, my husband did take six months off and but really I sort of managed the whole autumn winter on pretty much two hours work a day Okay. So, you know, my husband would take the baby for two hours and I did nothing except write. Like I replied to emails at other times, like on my phone while feeding and stuff and in the middle of the night. And um, I so I took that two hours and all I did was write my first draft, um, which I did then delete, which was even worse because the time was so hard won. Um, right. So and then you know I would give my husband two hours off. So we were very equal in the caregiving, which you know I I wanted to do. I I want to have it all, and that you know it's a perennial problem for women. I think in particular, um, so it did it did. And now he's older. We have a nanny um three days a week, but only nine to three, and he's actually a great napper. So he is asleep for like half of that. So that helps my guilt. Um, yeah. So that really works for us, actually. Um, and my husband then works four days a week, and so do I. So we each have a day with the baby. Um, so I do get four days to work. So yeah. that, you know, I'm way more sane now, uh, yes. now that I have actual designated time. The thing that I didn't realise, I think, the most was when I used to spend time alone before, it was not loaded whereas now it's a commodity with my husband that's like a big change for me like because uh -huh. you're doing your me time they're doing the parenting and that's like a transaction that we've not really had before so that that uh -huh. was a big change but actually the the writing and the identity that kind of went how I wanted it to like I was always going to write I think yeah Yeah, no, that makes super sense. So in two hour increments, you must have been sort of thinking like ahead of time, I have these two hours, what exactly am I working on? What, and so that you sat down and just, did you, you know, just were able to write versus like sometimes we spend yeah, this time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a lawyer before and it reminded me a lot of that. 
Um, and yeah, I find, I find having a baby quite mindful in many ways, or I, I did, he's older now, so it's more chaotic. <laughs> but yeah. when he was like a little baby, it was quite, um, I'd be feeding him for like an hour and yeah. I, my mind would spin. Um, but yeah, I think um, I just was super concentrated for those two yeah. hours. They, they were like four hours of old time, you know, and that's how it is, I think. Yes, you get to be more efficient. And and like you said, you appreciate the time more. And it also is it has a different weight to it because of the uh, the fact yeah. that somebody else is working while you're, you know, there's no sort of really free time anymore, right? It's, it's different. No. It's a different type of free time. So you write a draft. So you were at that point, you were writing this, were you writing this book or this was already done? I can't remember where. It was already done. Um, so okay. I've written a new book since yeah. the baby was born um, and I'm delivering it next week. Um, so. Oh gosh. Congratulations. Yeah. But, okay. So when you, um, when you wrote the first, so you, in this book, we, this is sort of, this is your pregnancy book, basically, right? Yes, correct. And, yeah. And you, and you had a good pregnancy. You felt good. Um, I was so. very fatigued, but I was yeah. very sleepy with it. So I could literally just sleep in the middle of the day and then recharge. Um, I don't know how people do that with a child, like with a toddler or whatever, but um, yeah, so I was fatigued and I was quite anemic, which contributed mm -hmm but yeah. I wasn't sick and I was quite active um it's a weird fatigue isn't it it's like really soporific like I could walk the dog miles and be fine but then sometimes I would just go to sleep like and I could sleep in all sorts of weird places where I've never like on a coach or whatever on a train yeah um yes very weird yes but yeah well, I mean I worked worked yeah. throughout yeah you were like I delivered so the page proofs of that um the day before my c-section <laughs> <laughs> you do you do sort of love to do these things right uh you know I know I just thought I, I want to stay on a book here and I was like right how can I actually do this then so we sort right. of really condensed the editing process um because I knew like I wouldn't be able to proofread a book with with a baby um yeah so I thought well, I've got to do it all before then um so it was like tough at times, but you know, it's fine. We, we can do get hard things, etc. We can yeah. do hard things. Exactly. And what do you, um, how do you feel about the, you know, you said this, you made this comment in, in acknowledgements about now you are experiencing the thing that you always write about, right. Which is the motherhood thing. And yeah. as you reflect now, like on, you know, wrong place, wrong time, she has a son, you know, Julia has a daughter, but Emma has a son. So how, you know, how does it feel? Does it, you know, it seems like you had it pretty right all along, but does it feel like it's weightier <laughs> now that you are a mom? Yeah, it does. And I think it's weird because parenting a baby is different to what I've written about in a way. Yes. yes. But I think because I don't know him yet, really, um, you know, his personality is beginning to emerge um I think there's some of it that what I would say is it feels a lot more natural than I portray like a lot of the mothers in my book are very self-conscious but I find myself thinking oh look you know I, I'd die for you but I don't um think about it consciously that's just yes. what I would like to do if you know right. the, the decision you hope arose. not to have to right exactly you yeah exactly but the, um, but the, as you said, the te the kids in the books are troubled. I mean, for the most part, troubled teenagers, right? I mean, that, the books that I yeah. have read are these kids who are, for one reason or another, in you know a bad position, and their parents are also have made decisions, you know, that are that make them them vulnerable, right? Julia, Emma, um, I I've, I've forgotten the mom from Wrong Place, Wrong Time, but yeah, you know, those yeah. are yeah. Yeah, I think different. I do. Yeah, it is different. I do like to write about teenagers because they have some autonomy. And I think for plot, that's interesting. Yes. Um, as to whether the emotions will be accurate, I suppose we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yes. Well, I think... Um... I think you've hit, you know, you've definitely touched on things that I find universal. I don't have teenagers anymore, but I, I've been through that. And I, um, and I think, you know, the, the emotions are absolutely on. I love the fact that we actually have, 
a bunch of parents in this book, right? It's kind of, mm. you know, we're, it's largely parents of kids who are, you know, um, in jeopardy one way or another, which is a really, and you do, you know, really one thing from, I mean, really from the, the more minor characters, there's a mosquito like right in front of my little devil. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm like trying to avoid him biting me but um and even down to you know sort of the characters in the the people she works with in the, in the police department like you know like her sort of most relied upon um colleague Jonathan also like kind of a new dad right so the, all these people um all these parents it's a very it's like a you know it's a collection of parents so tell us um it sounded like also from the acknowledgments um that it was your dad who came, who sort of made a comment that that helped you sort of um figure out the the twist of the book and that was really interesting. Tell us about that. How do these things happen? What do you guys talk about at the dinner table that this comes up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so he came up with um, who Olivia is, I suppose you could say. Yeah. I came up with the fact of how that arranges itself with the narrators. Of yeah. Um, but yeah, I basically said, I want to write about a missing woman, but I don't want her to be dead and I don't want her to have escaped or run away. And my dad was like, well, are there your two options really? And I always want to do something different to other yeah. thriller writers, I suppose. And he then said the twist. Um, right. And I just, I couldn't let go of it. And it was an off the cuff remark from him. And I thought, I really want to do this. Like, I really yeah. want to. And it did just, the twist controls the narrative of that book. Um, but I couldn't let it go, even when, you know, in the first iteration, um, it, it's really hard to talk about this without revealing it, but it, yes. um, I, it was different anyway. And right. it didn't it work. Multiple iterations to, to get it to really work, yeah. <laughs> So once you take, once you write your nine week draft, um, which I love that. And I, 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 you think you're, are you still writing a nine week draft now that you have? Well, um, so I wrote a first draft before the baby was born of yes. my next. And I have done a second, third, fourth and fifth draft since he was born. So I haven't actually done one, but I think so. It's about 2000 words a day. Um, so yeah, I think your, I probably will. that your... will be this September. That's your four days a week, about 2,000 words yeah, a day. Yeah, so I'm, I've am i lost a day. And unless I work right. during a nap, which I don't like to do because I have the baby completely by myself one day a week. And I think you go a bit insane if you work in the nap. Um, yeah. So Better to nap I lose that day. Nap. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Or like, you know, bake a cheesecake. That's what I did last Tuesday. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> but... <laughs> just something f for yourself you know but yeah. um I try and spread the work into the other days and maybe work a couple of hours at a weekend so yeah it's basically 2,000 words a day five days a week somehow yeah wow okay so you did a sec you did a second third fourth and fifth is that what you just said yeah but not yeah. so I'm about not, to deliver yeah not deleting all you only delete all well I deleted the first draft um but then I actually deleted the fourth draft <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah so wow um, I'm so impressed by this, this I know just, this takes well, kill your darling don't to be, a like, whole different level don't be I just yeah I don't know it's mad I, I would not recommend it um but that is what I've done <laughs> Yes, that's that's even more than than before. Um, okay, so then, um, so it sounds like I mean, it sounds as though you know this is your pattern. This is working for you. You're going to get to the point now where you're like, this is just how I work. You are there. You you embrace it, and I think that's probably important for all authors to know. You embrace it reluctantly. I, I mean, yeah, I do think every first draft I start, I think this will be the one I won't delete, um, because I don't think you can go into it feeling like that um but so I've never not done it so <laughs> and right, this is you're my right. tenth book <laughs> right so but you remain optimistic I think that's very important I do. it will happen perhaps. well is that delusional delusion and optimism might be two sides of the same coin right I mean here I we go so. I think so so what was it tell us about the Reese call like that had to have been just 
Oh my God, I just, it's funny as well, because I'm kind of long in the tooth, right? Like it was my seventh published book over here. It was my third in America. So unlike perhaps how I would have been if it was my debut, I knew what it meant. Um, And I just, uh, you know, even though I was pregnant and very fatigued, I didn't sleep for three nights straight. And it was just, um, my mind was just spinning and like, I couldn't talk about it with anyone. So that kind of, and I was actually on a tour. So I was in hotel rooms um, and I just thought this, like, this has changed my life forever. And I just couldn't, I couldn't process it. It took like a week maybe to sort of feel normal again. Um, It was just Mm -hmm. mad. And then it lived up to, all of those expectations in August like it did change my life and career irrevocably yeah it's so so amazing I I mean it's such a it's such an honor and it's so exciting and I I love that book I you know I love her book club because it is like women focused and um so woman positive and she's such a strong woman and um it is really like I can't even imagine and the call came from your agent I assume um, my publisher actually oh you're so it was a, it was 11 p.m and then I texted my agent afterwards like are you away yeah. <laughs> and she was <laughs> luckily um so yeah it was just I will remember I will remember it for the rest of my life and I will remember like hitting the New York Times for the rest of my life and everything happens late at night because of the time difference so I lost so much sleep <laughs> <laughs> Due to right. Excitement. right well that is the right that's the right way to lose sleep right you want it to yeah. be because of something like that well that is that is really really exciting and I know they do some beautiful things um do they still do the thing where they give you the art um yeah in fact can you see you it? it I'm surrounded by laundry no. this is mum life can you see it oh there? I can it's so beautiful I love that yeah that's, I love it it's so it's so yeah it's just the whole thing was just a dream <laughs> yes I can imagine that super. and did you feel like does it change the pressure I guess you'd already no you were still writing just I another missing writing. person yeah I think I think so I'm glad it was a very different book um because mm-hmm. although it's about parenthood it's super different it's not speculative it wrong place wrong time what's so interesting about it I thought was the conceit of the time travel where it's just another missing person it's the twist yeah and so it was a completely different offering but yeah I think you get used to that I think because all of my books here are bestsellers so I am you know not to brag but that's just a fact and I am sort right. of used to dealing with that you know but yeah I think it does up the ante with each book and you know I'm just plotting out my next book and I am thinking I know what I want it to be but I've already thought okay how am I going to set it aside from other thrillers and Mm -hmm. that is pressure but Mm -hmm. in a way I've sort of always felt that um yes right so yeah I think you have to close your mind to this otherwise yeah, to, right to the it. noise of course yeah. you go insane you'd be yeah paralyzed it's so true tell me um so you know when you so sounds I love this, the sort of way you think about you know the books that you wanted to write about a missing uh a, a missing woman but not in the way that other authors had done it and so um you know and also police corruptions and similarly not in the way that you know we normally think of police corruption which is for money or political power or whatever other reasons but for something much more personal and therefore um much more understandable i think um so when you're as you're thinking about that you know what made you think you wanted to write about a missing woman do you remember is that like is that just something you you'd sort of seen about and thought about or yeah i think um yeah, I think there's almost every thriller writer does a missing person book, I think. <laughs> um, and I sort of feel like I'm building this canon and that was sort of missing from it. That's the way that I felt like I kind of want in on this, but I want to do my own thing within it. That's how I felt. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how... I don't I guess you find this like I don't really know like what thought process is I just I know like I am 
I had this call recently with a hostage negotiator because my next book's about a siege. And he said to me, he's a freelance kidnap and ransom negotiator now. And I wow. thought my next book's going to be about kidnap and ransom. I just knew it. And then it was like right. finding the thing, right? the hook that sets it aside from kid, you know, the usual kidnap and ransom, which I've done. But I just knew. And then it's like, once you know your focus is narrowed and then it's like okay I just need to find a, an interesting slant on this and that's kind of how right. it goes for me I love yeah that's different I think sometimes that's the way that you describe it is different and I really I appreciate that that you would but it's more like a concept that you're going to address right yeah. it's missing persons it's it's you know you know hostage and, and ransom it's uh you know that is that is really and and you were playing I think with um wrong place wrong time you were playing with that the time dynamic that was yeah. sort of in your head when you started to write that book yeah like that was born out of I want to write a non-linear time yeah. book um yeah which is yeah, a different I way think I think it. that's unique yeah. I think that's unique think? To that's interesting I weirdly do. I... not to not to name drop but Lisa Jewell did say that to me she said you think in a conceptual way yes whereas I Lisa agree. thinks in a plot way I think, and I would say most of the, I think you're, this is going to be um, interview 89 or 90 for me. And I think you're one of the, you might be the only author I've ever heard describe it quite that way, that it's more well, of a concept to you. Yeah. Which I actually think there's something really unique about that. And I, I like that your sort of scope is not, because I think we can get really, you know, blocked and railroaded if we think of one plot right versus if we say we want to we wanted this thing this concept and then every plot is available right you could take yeah. kidnapping and ransom and make it about greed and revenge i mean all the you know all the seven they're you know main plots right and yet when mm -hmm. we talk about a plot about something specific it sort of narrows itself really naturally and maybe not that helpfully i'm taking notes jillian so that next time like you know i'm like <laughs> what am I gonna do <laughs> yeah like it's it is interesting um I think for me it's almost overwhelming to think what you know it could be this it could be this it could be this it could be this and so I have to narrow the focus um down to a topic and then for me I then find the hook so I don't think about it in a thematic way. I think, what does it say on the back of the book about this? Uh huh. So what would you just so yeah, basically so, you mean yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like I was just reading the back of the book <laughs> with yeah, yeah. So really, the back of the book is about chapter one, I guess, because um, that's the inciting incident. So like the book that I'm about to deliver is about a woman who is at work one day and there's a breaking news alert and um, a man has taken three hostages um, in a warehouse in London and then the police arrive in her work foyer and say your husband's caught up in this but he's not one of the hostages he's the hostage taker um, so it's really it's about a siege but the hook is what if your husband does that and you know what on earth could be the reason um so that's kind of how I went into that like I knew I wanted to write a siege and then I was like okay but I need a way in that isn't just there's a siege you know right 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 and then this was and then this was the book that launched you into the, what your next idea would be by the conversation you had with the expert that's yeah, yeah. and I do find I will do like a few books that sort of go together so mm -hmm. wrong place wrong time and just another missing person are a whodunit really they're a mystery um yeah. but then these two are like hostages and kidnaps <laughs> and then like the next two will be like other things I think so these um, are more like a why done it versus a who done it right we're trying to figure out why yeah. the husband would be wrapped up in that exactly yeah and I liked talking to the hostage negotiator so much that I thought I'm not really ready to leave this topic yeah um, 
and I think a ransom note is just about the most interesting thing <laughs> right now. And I know that, you know, you have to sustain that for a year. So yeah, I, as soon as I get that fire in my belly, like, oh, okay, I'm really, I want to read all about ransom notes. Like that's when I sort of know that's the way into the next one. Yeah. And are you fine? Do you sort of feel like you do the research ahead of time before you write your first draft? So you kind of know everything you think you, you need to know, even though, of course, we always have things that pop up. But is that sort of the way that you figure out a book? Yeah, sort of. So I'm reading a memoir at the moment about someone who was kidnapped for ransom. Um, because at the moment, I I know the hook, but I don't know anything beyond that because I'm I'll start it like in the autumn. Um and then I will, as I write, I tend I tend to befriend someone <laughs> for a few books. And so I will ask questions of my hostage negotiator. And just so that I'm not taking any, you know, complete right turns that would never happen. And then you have to redo, even though I delete it anyway. Um <laughs> but so he will kind of steer me and then I often will say look will you read these passages and tell me like you know I know that the big picture works but you know would they have this gun or this gun or you know and then right. kind of get steer that way right so you kind of you feel like you're as expert as you need to be for the you know in order to write that first draft which in your mind is not going to be deleted so there's going to be that <laughs> no <for> exactly <laughs> it's, a, it's a fallacy really but yeah <laughs> I love that. Now, is there, um, and I don't know, I don't think we talked about this last time. Do you have people that read along with you as you write, like a, you know, you're right, like a writer's group. So as you're writing, you know, especially when you're writing so intensely, 2000 words a day is, you know, that's pretty intense. So how do you get, how do you feel like you're not off track? Are you talking through this with somebody? Are you sharing pages? Or are you just sort of like, it's all in your gut? Um, yeah, nobody sees until my agent. So my agent reads and edits me and then I deliver to my publisher. So I'm doing her edits at the moment. Um, I do talk it over with my dad because he's quite good at really specific questions. <laughs> so like if you go, I don't know what I want the kidnap situation to be, he's he won't really say much. But if you say, if you received a ransom note telling you not to talk to the police, what would you do like he right. he would have definitely have an answer for that um so yeah I do talk it over with him I think less so since having a baby actually but I think more about it because I sort of have quite a bit of dead time sometimes like driving yeah. and stuff so um I think more I think then so you also and you take those you love to take your dog for and now probably also your son for big long walks and that's a time probably when you all your mind is also sorting through or are you listening yeah. or, you know, re reading or doing things um, while you're writing or, or walking or just sort of open space, open mind? Yeah, I do just think like I walked my dog this morning and I did think. I'm pretty sure I've come to the conclusion that I want this, this not to be a mystery. So, you know, who has kidnapped a teenager and it's a suspense novel. So like, how do they get the teenager back, basically? Um, and that's like a decision made on the dog walk, actually. And it's quite a fundamental one because it's not a who done it. It's not a, you know, it's not a sort of, oh, it's going to be the father or, you know, whatever. It's different. Um, and I think it's good to know those things. So, yeah, I sort of make those big decisions at sort of this time. And it feels mm -hmm. almost enormous. And I think you can't look it in the eye almost because I feel like these decisions make the book actually which I find quite scary <laughs> right right yeah especially knowing it like you said it's a year and it's a big investment in your time especially now that your time is you know is more precious so um yeah. can okay I I I have to can you tell us a little bit about the book you're turning in the hook or not the hook but the yeah the yeah the hook or the premise or yes yeah, so the book teaser. I'm turning in the book I'm turning in is the husband who starts the siege um and it's really about a marriage um and what I like most about it is that you think that the book is going to be the siege and at the end there's a resolution but about 20 percent in um the siege ends um the husband disappears and it jumps forward seven years um and he's still disappeared 
And it's really about, I suppose he's missing and it, you know, it, he kills the hostages. <laughs> so it's pretty real. Um, and the stakes kind of up because you think how on earth can this be justified? Um, and also I get to write about London in 2031 which is when the seven year timeline is, opens. And I'm finding yes. that so interesting. It's so interesting, like climate change and you know, ah. the small changes too. Right, um, right. So I suppose it has that, it's not really speculative, but it has that difference. Yeah, versus starting like setting the, the first scene up to be like seven years ago and opening in 2023. Yeah. You're pushing us forward, which is really yeah, interesting. No. Well, that, does it have a title? I know they change sometimes, but. Well, I don't know, actually. We're toying with seven years after, but I don't know uh -huh. if it reveals too much. Um, and I don't know uh -huh. if it's, I don't know. I'm like mulling it over. That's that's the title on the Word document at the moment. So we'll Got see. It. <laughs> Got it. I love that. Sorry, my, um, I have two dogs that are fighting. Hey, boys, outside. Go on, outside. <laughs> Oh my gosh these are my, these are my new children is these little tiny ones um oh, well I that see. is a, i kind of like the seven years after i'm not sure it gives away um anything until we yeah. just know 20 percent that he's gone for seven years but that is obviously not a very non-professional opinion for which that is worth exactly <laughs> what you paid for it which is nothing so this is so exciting okay give us <laughs> the actual the, the the live date of this book is august the first August the first. August the first, and today, that when you are listening to this podcast, is August the first. So today is actually your pub day. So and we're is. recording this obviously in advance, but happy pub day for this. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy you came back, and it was so it was so fun to hear about how much your life has changed and how wonderfully things are going. And um, I'm already like, when do I get to read the next next one? So that's um, well, yeah, I guess like. I don't know when proofs will be maybe like January um it's nearly done so that's exciting well I can I will I will wait till January in the meantime if you haven't read Jillian McAllister um this is only my second of hers but I I give her an A plus on both they're really super fun always unexpected um and I, even the title of this one is so great just another missing person as though that's what this is and it definitely is not just another missing person <laughs> um so it's a really fun plan words and um you're super talented and I'm so glad everything's going so well so congratulations oh, thank you that's so kind thank you it's so nice to come by yes it was so fun to come back and I'm looking forward to the next book already so everybody thank you so much for joining us today on Killer Women with Jillian McAllister she's uber talented obviously fabulous and smart and she also has a, a wonderful podcast which I've listened to a few episodes of and uh, called honest authors it goes into sort of publishing in the world in as you as it states honestly which is really fun to hear if you're an author an aspiring author or just interested in this crazy crazy business so thank you for joining <laughs> us and we will see you all thank next you so time much. bye, bye.